What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eigen Bros. Mm -hmm. Today, we're talking about nuclear bath salts. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pretty accurate, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're talking about, uh, I was going to say thermal... Dang, I'm always blanking on the name. <laughs> thorium. Thorium. I always want to call it thermal react. I guess it's thermal react. I just no. think of the Avengers. <laughs> thorium. <laughs> That's Every a time. great. That's a great image. Yeah. Yeah. I always think of thermal reactors, and I'm like, it's not a, technically not a thermal reactor. Well, I mean, well, I guess kind it of, is. It's yeah. Releasing heat. Yeah, yeah, it is. It but is. actually, a thermal reactor is a specific type of distinction that's actually different from the thorium reactors that. Yeah, exactly. It, it, so yeah. yeah, so technically it's not. But yeah, yeah. So this is, is where yeah, time. this is where I mess up all the time. So I would say today we're talking about thorium reactors. Yes, and, yes. Uh, then we kind of talk about um, uh, let's say I mean we we pretty much keep that up until the very end, which mm -hmm. we're we're talking about rebuilding society mm -hmm. based how on we would do it. yeah based on an alternative uh, energy source or something or how would you using the physics knowledge that we know how would we do it mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah I think. I think if you would like to know how to do that and survive an apocalyptic event and you want to be cool and give electricity to your, uh, to <laughs> to your, your tribe, to your tribe, <laughs> then definitely watch till the end. Yeah. Stick or around you're missing out. or else you're missing out. <laughs> so, so yeah. yeah. Um, make sure to follow us on socials, right? Mm -hmm. Well, first like share, mm -hmm. comment, subscribe if you haven't yet. Um, and then also guys, once again, check us out at eigenbros.com. I recently updated the website to make it look a little bit nicer. Check yeah. that out. Um, check out Twitter, eigenbros. Check out the Instagram, eigenbros as well. And then finally, check out the TikTok if it's still around, eigenbros2. <laughs> um, and that should be it. Anything else, Juan? No, that's it. All right, see you in a bit. Cool. Do oh, you yeah, yeah time at yeah. three, two, one. We're live. We are live. Oh, I'm forgetting how to do introductions. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm just <laughs> ready to go. He's ready. Um, ready to Good. go. I caved. I took a monster. I had a Sabbath. I had a caffeine Sabbath yesterday. You were doing so good, Juan. I had a caffeine Sabbath. You got to have one. You got to have one and you got to just, you know, you got to make these count. Baby That's steps. What I baby, baby steps. steps. But, Fair enough. God, but yeah. I'm always playing with my stupid mic, man. As soon as as soon as it began, I started. <laughs> Sorry. Such a rest, bad habit. Yeah. Rest in peace, headphone users. If... Uh, <laughs> No, I think I think it's fine. Yeah, leave in the comments if it's annoying as <laughs> that I keep playing with the mic. So I don't ever hear it, but um, Juan hears it. I do, I do, but only because I do audio. Mm -hmm. But it's fine, I think, generally. Let's hope, let's hope. Yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so let's as we talk about... Well, go, go ahead. Well, we promised last week that we would talk about um, an important topic that's that was kind of um, hinted at. Yeah. And it was... Um, Thorium. No, salt baths. Salt baths. Yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Although that's kind of related, <laughs> but I'm trying to figure out where you're going with this. No, salt baths, how relaxing they are, how, <laughs> you know, the science behind it, why is it Why is it so relaxing? <laughs> Strangely enough, salt baths are very relevant to thorium. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I figure. Okay, I wasn't sure if you knew that or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do, I do. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the thing is, um, I was kind of curious because... We we were debating it, right? We were like, why isn't thorium reactors are seen as this like uh, holy grail in in the in the uh, how would you say in the zeitgeist? Yeah, the in the in the energy community, right? Yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Or yeah. I guess yeah, yeah. Currently, within like the past decade or so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It constantly yeah. harped on, just saying like you know, why why isn't it a thing? Yeah, so I guess let's. Um, I'll go ahead and do all the spoil. I'll give. I'll give everything. Spoiler alert. Well, I'll just give everything up right now in case yeah. you know people don't want to watch an hour long podcast to figure it out. So basically, it was pretty much like we thought. So last week we kind of speculated on why thorium wasn't a thing, and from the research I did, my conclusion is has it has to do with money and physics or slash engineering. So is it legit? Yes, it is legit, um, and. But the problem with it has to do with money, pretty much, is my 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 conclusions. Yeah, and um, by money you mean like the cost of infrastructure or like adapting. So, what do you mean? So the thing is, thorium is supposed to be cheaper actually in its construction, but the problem is, thorium reactors work so differently from the water-based cooling reactors that we have oh, already that it's a lot of like redesigning the whole architecture. And research basically stopped on thorium like 
decades ago. Like, are we so, talking about 70s or 80s or something? Well, yeah, but 90s? then also they revamped it a little bit, and there were two, um, they call them uh, MSRs or, um, crap, I suck at acronyms, I'm sure I remember, <laughs> um, molten salt reactors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sounds about right. Those research, those research uh, projects basically stopped in like 2011 or something. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Conspiracy? Um, no, I'm just kidding. I don't remember why, but uh, no, because they were retaken up by um, uh, China for one, has put more money into researching uh, so thorium reactors. So China is like a... I imagine China is a big player in this because they're probably looking for a safe way to produ- mass produce cheap energy, right? Yeah, because you know how it is. In China, they got horrible atmosphere. I mean, their pollution and CO2 emissions was something like six times the amount of the U.S. Mm. Um, and uh, you know how Beijing just has horrible, horrible skies. I know, yeah. you know, we have uh, friends who, you know, work, well, I don't know. I think you do as well, one um, mm. in, in our uh, graduate physics program who have gone to China yeah. and even people who are from China and they talk about, especially people who haven't lived there, a buddy of mine specifically I'm, I'm thinking of just hated China because it was just so, um, you couldn't breathe there without a mask. It was just, Dang. the pollution was so bad. Dang. That's insane. And you just feel, he just felt dirty. When you would walk on the streets, you just feel like you're just covered in just a Oof. layer of dirt. That's, that's, that's crazy. But I mean, it makes sense because you, you talk about a, a population density that's, you know, it, it's like New York, but pretty much. Like, probably way worse. Probably way worse. Because yeah. we're talking about, you know, U.S. is 300 million. Yeah. It's not, it's not a lot. Not compared to the billions. Not billion compared to the China billions. <laughs> China and India, like all these other countries like that, that are just like building up to mm-hmm. become financial economies in some sense. Yeah. Like they're, yeah, they're, they're just got a massive population density um, and they have to produce uh, energy like right now the cheapest the cheapest way to get energy because it's heavily subsidized is oil right you you you're kind of just yeah I think that yeah that still is the cheapest way um of course we're most of the nations in the world um, at least the leading um, industrialized nations mm. um, are trying to look into clean energy so the top choices of course being wind you know solar um, I think those are the two top. Of course, storage is a big one now. You know, we got Elon Musk on the scene with the gigafactories and whatnot. Um, not sure how clean that one is exactly, though, but storage is, is pretty critical for um, clean energies. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, nuclear energy is the number one, pretty much, probably. Well, why has why nuclear gotten such a bad rap? So I'm pretty sure you know this, um, and I'm sure probably a lot of the audience knows this as well. Is just nuclear energy is kind of one of these testy things because basically the whole concept of nu- nuclear radiation. So when a nuclear reactor has a meltdown, see... Um, the, the most famous one recently was Fukushima. Fukushima, right? Chernobyl. Um, these things have been a giant stain in our society that people just don't want repeats of this. And, you know, people tend to put a lot of their faith and trust in the scientists mm-hmm. doing their job properly. And these are clear examples of when things just go wrong, horribly well, wrong. Well, to be fair, it's not the scientist's fault. And, yeah, and, it's and easy in to those say. Cases, no, in those cases, I think they're they're big, they're big examples of uh, bureaucracy getting in the way. Because I think I think there were a lot of reports that there were issues reported up up the channels, but they the politics got in the way, and people were trying to impress uh, other, I guess, higher ups by showing that they're running things efficiently. And cost effective. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, I got that impression from Chernobyl. I know there was a series and on the same it. thing with Fukushima as well. Okay, I thought That's, Fukushima was just unavoidable. Just the damage was so bad. I think uh, I think there were reports done about this and very similar very similar parallels with Chernobyl. Really? Yeah. Well, there you go. Politics, but that's the you got to <laughs> still account for politics too. The human element is, yeah. This is yeah. The human element is very real, right? Yeah. Politicians and bureaucrats are always going <laughs> to fuck things up, so you always have to factor them into the equation. Yeah. And really, the nice thing about thorium reactors is it's one of these. It sounds almost too good to be true, but it's a reactor that basically is meltdown proof in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, its construction allows it so that if there was a potential overheating of, or like let's say like a uncontrolled reaction mm-hmm. um, from the uh, from the fissile uh, elements, 
within the um, the uh, the uh, chamber, then there are safeguards against that where um, the thorium, since it's actually liquid, well, the main type of thorium reactor that people are looking into is the liquid fluoride uh, thorium reactor. And it's basically like you have liquid thorium in a tank mixed in with liquid or molten salt. So basically what happens is that salt gets heated as the thorium reaction occurs, mm-hmm. as the nuclear reaction occurs from the thorium. Um, and there's actually a little ice, they call it like a freeze plug or something. So it's sitting in like a vat, if you imagine that. Mm-hmm. And a freeze plug's at the bottom, so it's like a cork almost. Mm-hmm. And that freeze plug is just kept cooled. But then if the reactor actually overheats, that freeze plug melts, and then the whole thing is just um, dumped into a uh, cold vessel. Wow. So that's one of the, advantage of the of advantages of the liquid... Uh, the liquid, um, th- uh, liquid fluoride, uh, fluoride thorium yeah, reactor yeah, yeah. is because you actually, the liquid makes it so you can use gravity to get rid of the, um, mm. the, uh, the, um, uncontrolled reaction, I mm-hmm. guess. Whereas with a normal typical, you know, um, water, um, reactor that we're used to, it actually uses, uh, solid fuel rods, which you can't really do that with Yikes. once the reaction is, is gone um it's it's over then there's many ways to mess it up it's under a high pressure as well so it's under high vac or high high pressure so if it gets depressured then all of that stuff outgasses and, ex- and escapes into the ch- into the facility basically and now you have radioactive uh gas wow so there's just so many factors in normal rea- nor- normal nuclear, nuclear reactors, reactors that just are not good um, and thorium actually fixes a lot of those things. Mm-hmm. So, the, in contrast to regular, the more popular nuclear reactors, the more, more popular nuclear reactors are based on uh, more heavy elements, right? I think, or heavier elements. Uh, I want to say plutonium. not so much heavier. Um, yeah. It's like uh, it's still uranium, plutonium, mm-hmm. um, and then, of course, as we I think I, I think we even speculated last time, the reason that we use nuclear reactors was because we could get the plutonium. Um, uh, waste products from that and make nuclear bombs with mm-hmm. them. Um, so people were interested back in the times when there was a debate on which way. So there's this basically split between parties on should we make thorium reactors or should we make uranium plutonium reactors? And uh, we went with the uranium plutonium ones. For obvious reasons. For I obvious think. reasons because we were into making bombs, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so the U.S. government piggybacked off of... Uh in that, in that sense, right? The U.S. military. Yeah. They were like, why not? We'll just kill two birds, right? Mm-hmm. We, we need bombs. We need energy. Let's do yeah. both. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so then that was basically the fate of thorium. And uh, thorium kind of just disappeared for a long time. And not even people who had PhDs in nuclear physics mm-hmm. even knew about thorium, really, after a certain point. Like, mm-hmm. this is something that only kind of fairly recently surfaced during a TED Talk by a guy named uh, Kirk Sorensen. He's a uh, NASA nuclear engineer. Oh, nuclear phys- hey, that's physicist. A, yeah, it's a big guy. Oh, you know him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a big proponent of thorium, and he was the one that kind of broke the news. And it's really interesting how he did it because he wasn't even really seeking it out. He was trying to actually build, um, for NASA, I think they had some program where they were trying to think of how you can actually make moon bases and actually get power to those moon bases. So if you think of the types of power there are, there's wind, there's solar, there's electric, there's hydroelectric, mm-hmm. um, um, there's uh, nuclear, mm-hmm. and really there's no wind on the moon. There's solar is a problem because there's just not enough energy to keep that going. You know, yeah. the moon goes around the or the moon goes around the Earth mm-hmm. once a month, and it's blocked for like several months, so you can't really do th- solar that way. Um, hydroelectric is not going to work because there's no water on the moon. So really, nuclear power is the only option. Mm-hmm. So then he's like, but here's the thing. Nuclear power, as our current iteration of it, yeah. we, requires water. Yeah. And there's just not that much water. So then he came to the conclusion that once he found a book on thorium, yeah, uh, these thorium reactors, he realized that thorium was actually the greatest way to go for a, a, new, for a, a um, power plant on the moon. Because thorium is this abundant element on the moon as mm-hmm. well as on Earth, um, that's that's pretty. Uh, I think it's pretty stable. I don't quote me on that. I think it's pretty stable though. Mm-hmm. It's not um, radioactive. I don't think yet. 
or very lowly radioactive. Um, and it doesn't require any high pressures or anything like a normal nuclear reactor does. You can build it in a smallish kind of space. Um, and it just seemed to be the, the vastly better yeah. option. So he's yeah. like, why have we never heard of this? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. why are people not talking about this? Why can't we use thorium on Earth? And then he realized it was basically a political decision. And yeah, and then the rest was history. Now he is the um, whole foundation he started. Um, I think it's yeah. called like um, f- uh, for Thor. He's got a website. I forget what it's called, but it's got to do with promoting thorium. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's kind of his mission now. And a lot of people are interested in thorium reactors now. Yeah, thorium is actually three times more abundant than uranium. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So that just shows, and it's very abundant on the moon. So yeah, it's like this is clearly the best option yeah. to go with. Yeah, because it says here that uh, it's not fissile on its own, which means reactions mm-hmm. can be stopped when necessary. It produces waste products that are less radioactive mm-hmm. and generates more energy per ton. Right. Yeah, and but also another another thing is. It's kind of funny because um, it seems to me that forgot to start my call. no. There's 14 minutes here. Yeah, but I can't see the um, <laughs> the interesting thing is that it seems to me like uranium reactors need more maintenance. Or need they a do. Lot of maintenance. They do. They have a lot of extra components too that a thorium reactor doesn't need. Mm-hmm. So they have a lot more crap added onto them that thorium reactors will just get rid of if they ex- if they could exist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for one, the really big one being uh, the high pressure, um, you, you need basically a high pressure tank around your actual reactor. And that's because if you do, let's say if you do break pressure in the reactor, mm-hmm. the main reactor, you are going to get a giant outgassing of all the nuclear radioactive particles. And they have to be able to fill within the tank. Mm-hmm. Thorium doesn't need to do this because if you there is no pressure, high pressure needed for thorium. Um, when you have a thorium reactor... It just can operate at normal atmospheric temp- at atmospheric uh, temperature, so you don't need to actually put it under pressure. Mm. Um, some other things I think that are involved with uh, nuclear reactors. Um, let me think. You also need to have it close to a water source. Yeah, um, and then you you can you can pretty much. I mean, this is what happened with Fukushima, right? Yeah, the meltdown. Like it it it. It starts expelling radioactive waste into waste the water. Into the water, yeah. and so yeah. and yeah, that that's like one of the saddest things that you can imagine because then it starts seeping into the local environment, and then right. yeah, you get catastrophic effects like Chernobyl, like yeah, like Fukushima, mm-hmm. where it's you get really long lasting, irrever- well, not irreversible, but long lasting environmental effects that you well, basically irradiated your environment. Way no, more than sorry. A century. Uh, 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 like a hundred years. Like no, like ten thousand years. Ten thousand years. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. The thing with thorium is its waste products only last for about three hundred years or so, mm. and those are fairly easy to actually maintain as well. Yeah. So thorium has. It seems like thorium is like this miracle thing that it's just like why did we not push for it? Mm-hmm. And it just makes sense that it was because of bureaucracy, pretty much. But it was to me, in my opinion, just seems like it was completely the wrong, the wrong move. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because right now I think uh, the reports that India leads the pack when it comes to commercialization. Uh, mm. So it holds a quarter of the world's known thorium reserves. I see. Um, United States has a lot of thorium, though. Yeah, but yeah, they, they, India is the one that's moving towards uh, thorium. Interesting. Yeah, but it makes Which sense. They have they have a huge yeah. Yeah. And uh, and it's just interesting. Like, I think as you and I, you and I were speculating on 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 why we don't see more of this, and I think it's because you don't in the U.S. But I I think it might be due to the fact that we don't have somebody like like an Elon Musk kind of person. Mm. Um, I know we we harp on Elon Musk all the time, yeah, but yeah. but it's because we're shills. We're shills. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's because like he's a prime example of somebody in in our who's not so far removed from our generation. I think he's about twenty twenty years older than us, probably maybe ten fifteen. Yeah, probably about twenty years old. Twenty years old than us, yeah, maybe ten to f- fifteen to twenty. Fifteen at the very least, I imagine. Yeah. Um, and. But but he has similar ideas in the sense that he's always thinking about these bigger things 
and mm-hmm. taking these things that other people think is are impossible mm-hmm. um in in the common how would you say uh the uh the common um yeah I'm trying the to way of the doing two. things what's the word i'm looking for the like, orthodox maybe yeah orthodox but just just the 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 established way of yeah. doing things yeah. where it's like oh you, you're going to use you're you're thinking about using reusable rockets that's hilarious right right or, you just have tons of naysayers when it comes to any kind of innovation like this, yeah. which is par for the course, right? Mm-hmm. And when you're a guy like Elon Musk and you're innovating on all fronts, then people just think you're you're just whacked out. Oh, you're going right? to make an electric vehicle that's yeah. also luxury? <laughs> yeah. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Right. And then 10 oh, years later- Oh, you're going to make an, in, an internet company with satellites all in space? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then ten, <laughs> The list goes on, right? Yeah. Then 10 years later, you make, you're you a billionaire. You, yeah. You're, you're passing worth, Warren Buffett in you, terms of in terms of uh, monetary value. Yeah, in 10 years. <laughs> and yeah, it's just like, um, but it's it, 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 the nuclear energy, I guess, in this case, or energy needs somebody to take the helm in that way, right? You think? Well, honestly, I think the governments could do it. Um, it's a good sign that China and India are looking into this because I think it might go that way just from government assistance. Mm-hmm. It would be, I think it'd be faster per, potentially if commercial people took it under, yeah. but I think it's a very risky venture because it's going to cost a lot of money and also research because I think there are some problems but in that's terms how they of start, physics though. with thorium. Hmm? But that's how these things start. Like you, you, you pave the way using your own money. Like not always. That's actually the unprecedented, um, the unprecedented way things are starting now within our lifetime. If you think about all kinds of real big innovations in terms of like science, it's usually within the oh, public backed. sectors and government backed, right? Yeah. Cause there's less risk. Yeah. Commercial, commercial products were made once the science has already been established. Yeah. And thorium has some hangups in terms of its science. How so? Um, well, it's because the fact that the molten salt reactors which is kind of the main one that people want to use with thorium Mm -hmm. because then you can have thorium be liquid and you have a very safe um, architecture. That architecture is very, very different in terms of the normal reactors we already use when it it comes to, you know, using water. So you you can't necessarily retrofit. No, it's going to be a, it's going to be how I heard it described from a nuclear engineer was that it's like a big, it's, it's, Someone who's it's it sidesteps from normal lateral thinking in a in a non significant way, or in a significant way. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's going to take some cleverness to be able to figure out how to actually build a thorium reactor in a feasible, cost effective way. Gotcha. There's a couple leaps. If, if you're using, if you're trying to use the current infrastructure, like of old, old uh, abandoned nuclear facilities that have right. been shut down because there there have been numerous nuclear facilities that have been decommissioned yeah. out of uh, fear of nuclear meltdowns. Yes, and there have been, and I think some of the, actually the older um, molten salt reactors were like, um, they were old nuclear reactors that were customized for uh, using thorium after a bit. Mm-hmm. I I don't remember what happened though. I I forgot to research that part fully, but sure. The the experiments got stopped in 2011 for some reason. I think they didn't pan out fully, but um that's why China and India and I guess some of these other nations are trying to actually do more research and development to see how they can build a really solid thorium reactor, probably based on some of that research that they did already. So it's got some ways to go, and you know money is going to have to be involved for sure. Yeah, would, an investment. Would that be something you would like if you were to get into the business venture of like energy, mm-hmm. like Me investing? Yeah, let's say you had a bunch of money. Yeah, uh, would that be something that you think you would get into if you if you could? Oh, hundred percent. If I could figure out a way, I don't really know much about investing in that kind of stuff. I'm really, really a newbie when it comes but to let's investing. Say, but let's say you have the wherewithal. You're a physicist. You you have the you have the brain of somebody who can be clever and think of sure. clever ways to solve problems. Mm-hmm. Do you think this would be something that you would look into? Yeah. yeah. If I if I wanted to put if I could somehow put a money put money into thorium energy being something of of value in the future, I would definitely put a lot of money into that. Mm-hmm. Because it seems very very feasible, way more feasible than something like fusion for example. Right. Within the short term, um that's going to have a high yield I would believe in terms of um practical practicality. Pr- practicality and just also replacing a lot of the energy needs that we have because 
I think in the future, I mean, you can already see the wheels in motion that most of the world is sick of using these um, pollutants and CO2 emit, uh, emitting types of um, right. energy infrastructures. So we need to yeah. reduce our carbon footprint. And, and the thing is, yeah, and the thing is, like, we, we're going to get into climate change because there are people that, these the the people that are pushing back on the climate change thing like Republicans we almost have to bypass <laughs> yeah we almost have to bypass them entirely like yeah we can't yeah. they can't be in the conversation anymore we have to make these advances with without them well these are just goofy American I, I know but right? that's what I mean that, this is not even a political issue in the rest country. of the world like <laughs> they just look at us as retarded people that make everything politicized <laughs> um, so it's gonna happen regardless of what Republicans want or not uh-huh. um, not to shit on Republicans I love Republicans um, especially fiscally but um in terms of like things like climate sh- well i guess this is kind of a fiscal issue in some sense it is because it was made a, a fiscal issue by you know gas companies and things like that that yeah. kind of manipulated yeah the dialogue the, the conservative party towards this but it's going to happen regardless right the world is going to the world isn't doesn't care if you're going to be um conservative or not everybody yeah. else is going to do what needs to be done in reality yeah we're all trying so, to find ways to move forward and i think yeah, it's it's going to be an important dialogue of like th- th- this is I th- I think this is something that needs to happen, and how to make it happen is the the question, right? Yeah, well, especially money is definitely America. gonna have to be involved, though. Yeah, especially in America, but yeah, but also ingenuity, innovation, sure, um, sure. But I think it's a mantle. But I you think, throw enough money at it, I feel like it could, <laughs> it's gonna come about. Yeah, but I think our generation uniquely is having to deal with this because we're having to deal with the long term implications of industrialization, right? Like if we talk about the industrial era that happened a hundred years ago, mm-hmm. and you know China's kind of going through its own industrial age in the span of 20, 30 years yeah, or something. Yeah, they're really cooking. But cooking they've, with fire. they've, you know, America had the luxury of spreading it out for almost 100 years. Yeah. As opposed to China, where it's like it condensed all that pollution in 30, <laughs> yeah. 40 years, and then people are going to yeah. get cancer and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I they're think trying it's, to catch up. Yeah, and I think a lot of industrial... Look, I'm not opposed to industrialization because I get that you're getting... You're increasing the standard of living... You're increasing, um, mm-hmm. like, like just survivability in a lot of places. Like mm-hmm. most most children don't live past the age of five. Mm-hmm. Like in a lot of these third world countries. So, right, getting everybody to this to this level is a, a humanitarian issue for me. So, yeah. I think the world needs to be industrialized, but getting there cheaply and cleanly is probably the best way. Because right now, a lot of these countries that are coming up they, they have to rely on fossil fuels right right but it's just it's just gonna create pollution yeah, yeah. it's gonna t- create a lot of emissions that we're starting to not be able to we can't really afford to keep doing it like this we need no. to we need to really start curbing our footprint here yeah and i'm glad that china and india and these nations are trying to look into that because um i think honestly i think we could bring down emissions quite a lot because nuclear power is very very um good in term uh, environmentally compared to a lot of the other um uh sources of energy even yeah, over think, like wind and i think um, better than solar and, yeah, and yeah. solar and wind both yeah, right both, nuclear yeah. is the best option of all of them yeah i think and it, i'm gonna look this up but don't quote me on it but i think it's true i think yeah i've think looked it up right. um, oh you did okay yeah and it and it like we're is, talking about margins like of like what 10 percent greater like at least i forget the exact margins um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to be bold enough to say yes. I, I, but I'm pretty sure that nuclear energy is the lowest CO2 emitting uh, form of um, energy generation there is. Mm-hmm. So if we could make thorium reactors and, and a lot of the in every let's say and if every industrialized nation was using thorium as their main power source, I think that would help a tremendous amount. Mm-hmm. And then we wouldn't have to even worry about doing things like really taxing um companies you know we had the climate change episode we were trying to think of how to curb co2 emissions if we could just knock it down by just having all of the energy infrastructure replaced with clean energy infrastructure then you wouldn't have to even tax industries really on co2 expulsion because Mm -hmm. then they'll just want to use whatever the cheapest and available source is which would Mm -hmm. be like thorium yeah so so this would change yeah this would this has massive implications for for the economy i think um 
But what was what was that guy? Uh, what was his name? The guy who did the TED talk, Kirk Sorensen. What was his like takeaway? Like his like, big takeaway? Yeah, yeah. Basically, um, he's his big take. His big takeaway is just basically introducing the whole world to thorium, mm. because as soon as he did that, that's when people only became aware of it. You know, people in nuclear physics, nuclear physics PhDs did not even realize about thorium reactor. Yeah, be, even realized that thorium reactors were a thing until he came on the scene. A lot of people didn't really know about it. They didn't know yeah. that it was such a good, viable energy resource. They just thought, you know, like most people would think, you know, the reason we didn't use thorium was probably because it was shittier than uranium plutonium nuclear reactors. Yeah. They didn't realize it was just a straight up political move um, that was also because we wanted weaponization. But actually, the crazy thing is really now they're thinking that thorium even might be good for making weapons. So that's also that could also be a, a negative point towards it. <laughs> so thorium apparently can make ur- enriched uranium. Oh, interesting. They used to not think it would because of some special property. Um, I can't remember the exact property, but um, apparently they're saying people now speculate it actually might be easier to make better enriched uranium to make weapons now. So enriched uranium is like, is it like, uh, you know, it's like, Uranium is like the great value Walmart version. <laughs> and then enriched uranium is like the Gucci belt wearing. Pretty uranium. accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty accurate. What, what is that about? What is enriched uranium? So enriched uranium is just a purer form of uranium. Mm-hmm. Pretty much how it sounds. It just, it gives you a higher yield of nuclear power, nuclear, um, nuclear bomb capabilities. So you can make a more explosive bomb that way. Mm. And you pretty much need it. It's a more reactive make, version. Yeah, you, you need pretty much need it if you want to make high power nuclear weapons. Um, but yeah, um, and apparently thorium can create that. Um, I think it's U two thirty three or U two thirty five or something. I can't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, but thorium is U two thirty two. It's a it's a fertile product that turns into a fissile product um, due to beta decay. So we can get into the physics a little bit. So what basically happens is with thorium. Um, you actually start the the fertile the f- uh, fissile reaction by bombarding with with neutrons. So basically, when it has a slow moving neutron, that slow moving neutron um, gets absorbed by the thorium atom. Yeah. The thorium atom now becomes from thorium two thirty two to thorium thorium two thirty three. Mm-hmm. That that um, neutron then decays into I think probably an electron and an anti electron neutrino or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then that leaves it with a proton in the nucleus. So now it's become uranium-233. Mm-hmm. Or I'm sorry, protactinium-233. Mm-hmm. Then that protactinium is short-lived, and that decays again with another electron, anti-electron neutrino, and then it becomes uranium-233. And that uranium-233 is the main um, uh, the main fissile product of the nuclear reaction that actually generates the heat gotcha. to heat up the um, salt, the molten salt. Mm-hmm. And then that molten salt, of course, heats up the steam, and then that steam actually um, generates the turbine, which generates the power. Gotcha. So it's pretty simple if you yeah. think about it, but you're like, that's not doesn't sound so complicated, but obviously it's mostly like the engineering and all that kind of stuff yeah, and yeah. the clever physics you need with the um, with the molten salt uh, car- uh, carrying over that heat, I believe. I don't want to get too specific into that because I don't know exactly, yeah. but the engineering controls are the there's I think, but I think also the physics has some some problems as well. Mm. There's some problems with the physics too, because we we're not used to dealing with molten salt reactors, so it works differently than water. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the whole perk of the molten salt reactors is you don't need fuel you don't need solid fuel rods for it. You can actually have the actual um, you can have the actual nuclear. Um, product inside of the um the coolant as well so it just makes it way easier and then you can have things like the freeze plug where you can dump the whole yeah. thing if it if it overreacts so the rods if i remember correctly the rods serve as sort of catalyst right yeah the fuel rods are basically what the thorium is fuel rods are basically what thorium is to the um the liquid um fluoride th- uh thorium yeah. reactors but in the picture of uranium uh, nuclear reactors, the the fuel rods are rods of uranium. Yeah, I think they are. But they're a little bit more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they're like some weird, um, like combo of elements that makes it um, work. But I don't know too well because I didn't research as much on the mm-hmm. typical nuclear reactors. Um, 
But I think they work very similarly. They just get bombarded by neutrons. I think they're higher energy neutrons, yeah, though. Yeah, I think they would be. Um, and then they release the products. They also have more waste product, and you can use less in the um, fuel you, rods. Yeah. So thorium reactors are much more efficient in, um, in terms of actually producing energy as well. Gotcha. Um, probably by, uh, by at least 10%, maybe even more mm-hmm. efficiency. So it's a pretty good amount. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's very similar, I think, to how it works in terms of the physics, mm-hmm. the basic physics, that, that is. Yeah, it doesn't seem that, doesn't seem that complicated. No, it seems no. very understandable. I mean, that actually blew my mind when I, was, when I was first learning about this, that how nuclear reactors are just basically glorified steam engines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you said it converts, it heats up the bath, and then yeah. you, you just get steam. And you get steam, and then that generates a turbine. Like, all this work is just to make steam. <laughs> <laughs> all this science is to make steam. Yeah. yeah, you don't realize that until you start to get into, like, the actual science. You're like, oh, man, all this shit is just the steam engine in different forms. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's kind that of funny. true, huh? Because it's like, yeah, because then you talk about all the fuel changes throughout the era, right? Yeah. Throughout, throughout time, I guess. Uh, except batteries. I think batteries are the only one that don't like. Right, right. Batteries are a little bit more complicated because they're chemical reactions, right? So they're actually, yeah, the chemical, there's like, they're a chemical reaction that actually moves electrons. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, batteries are only. And also like batteries. hydroelectric too, because hydroelectric, you actually can. It actually can turn a turbine from the water movement, and then that kinetic energy from the water actually yeah. can turn a wheel, which can turn a, yeah. a whatever. I loved know, reading those stuff. books back in the seventies or eighties when when the Hoover yeah. Dam was built. No, I think it was mm-hmm. in the seventies or sixties. Okay, I don't know when the gov- when the U.S. government actually built was was preoccupied with building infrastructure, mm-hmm. <laughs> having big infrastructure programs like the Hoover Dam and stuff. When they built that, because it's it's one of the biggest hydroelectric dams, right? I think. I think you're right. And uh, I've never been. I should I should probably visit. Yeah, me either. <laughs> Where is it at? Uh, I don't know. Hoover, Hoover somewhere. No, I'm just <laughs> Hooverville. Hoover, Ohio. <laughs> I, I would I'm gonna guess. I'm a bad American if I don't know where the Hoover Dam is. Huh? <laughs> is that what you're gonna look up now? Yeah. Hey yeah. man, I'm right there in the same boat as you, so I don't know. Oh, there's a there's a there's a city in Alabama called Hoover. Okay. Uh, but you got to look up where it's Hoover Dam. But I don't know if that's where it is. No, it's in Nevada. <laughs> Nevada. Okay. I figured because you get those pictures Nevada. of the Nevada. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a hydroelectric dam. But I remember reading like books when I was a kid. Um, I don't read books anymore uh, <laughs> as an adult. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm a heathen. The, uh, <laughs> no, but but like you, I remember reading uh, like just books saying that th- this is the future. Everything's going to be hydroelectric because it's like clean. Oh, really? Yeah, because it was clean and they were hyping it up that... I remember books saying geothermal was going to be the future. Geothermal is another one that yeah. was also hyped up, huh? I didn't really get that one, though. I still don't know what it is, really. Is that just volcanoes related or something? Somehow? Yeah, yeah. So you use like... Uh, I think I, I think in certain regions, it's, it's advantageous to use certain types. You, you almost exploit the environment that you're in. This is a smart way of doing things where you... Exp- oh. What are they throwing water into volcanoes and then using that as a <laughs> steam, steam engine? <laughs> no, no, no. I think geothermal, like for instance, I think in New Zealand they have one of the biggest geothermal plants, um, but because they 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 lie underneath a um, um, some kind of uh, how would you say? I don't know. I don't know anything about them geothermal pretty ignorant of geothermal <laughs> honestly um plants yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to remember okay because this is like a decade ago i feel I, like it has something to do with heat and volcanoes though maybe it doesn't have something to do with the molten lava under there's crust or something maybe <clears throat> they use uh both water and heat so okay so maybe it is what i was thinking were, it is maybe it's not a joke where they actually are like putting water into fucking Lava and then the steam. Yeah, is so they, they they use resources that come from either dry steam wells or from hot water wells. Um, they drill wells into the earth and then piping hot steam or water to the Dude, surface. It's, it's, it's what it is. It powers man. the turbines that generates electricity. <laughs> wow, the troll is real. Mm-hmm. This is the great thing about being a physicist. Your bullshit can actually be true. You can, sometimes. You can speculate. You can speculate on based on logic <laughs> right. of operations, simple operations. Like, no, it can't be that dumb. <laughs> oh, really? It actually is. Yeah. So the dry steam plants. There are three types of geothermal power plants. Um, 
One of them is a dry steam plant. So it uses steam directly from a geothermal reservoir to turn generator turbines. And this is the one that I remember seeing. Like there's a pl- picture of like, there's like some underneath, there's some like thermal source that, that you can use to heat up uh, or evaporate water in right. that sense. And then they just exploit the fact that they don't need to use he- produce energy to yeah. or have anything to produce. The heat's heat. already there. Heat's already there. So you just let a water, you just somehow guide water into that yeah. area and then the steam will just yeah. boil off. I think That's it, smart. Yeah. And then the flash steam plants take high pressure hot water from deep inside the earth, meaning that they typically run, I think they run pipes underneath mm. to, to run through to get hot, mm-hmm. right? And then they run it back up uh, to the surface. So they take high pressure water, hot water from deep inside the earth and convert it to steam to drive generated turbines. Okay. When the steam cools, it condenses to water and is injected back into the ground to be used again. Mm. Um, so that that's also another example of like, I've, I've seen pictures or diagrams where it's like, yeah, they show a pipe that's up here mm-hmm. of, of the water source. And the water is typically... It's a closed system, so the water doesn't really evaporate and escape into the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. So it's like just – it's constantly being refueled into the system. So mm-hmm. it's a pretty it's a pretty cool, neat little thing. It sounds very um, environmentally um, good. Yeah. Because you're not really adding any – you're not really adding any pollutants in that system, yeah. right? Yeah. It's just literally using water and heat that already exists. Mm-hmm. That's – Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And then there's a binary cycle plant to transfer heat from the geothermal bath to another liquid. And honestly, but, I feel like you could even couple that with hydroelectric. Yeah. Because you yeah. can have a hydroelectric um, facility that also has a kind of like irrigation path towards, uh, well, I, I don't know if they can exist in the same areas, but if it, if it's possible where you can just have some something that guides the water down to the steam. Mm-hmm. So you can have like a double kind of facility in some weird way. Yeah. I think if I was living in a, if I was, if I was like in a post-apocalyptic environment, Mm -hmm. that's probably the first thing I would, like, if I were going to recreate society, I would probably do it using something like that. Mm -hmm. Because then you don't need to use these crazy Yeah. And it's so easy to know, like you could probably come up with a way that at least if you needed energy, you could do it. (laughs) Yeah. And then you can start small and build up from there with enough people once you guys get the idea in your mind because you could build a basic turbine yeah right and you could probably Uh, and probably like 10 people at least could live off of that really well wait how would you do that then how would you convert the uh because let's say you do have let's say you you are trying to rebuild society yeah let's do it i like this (laughs) i I love these games i love rebuilding society (laughs) in my mind when the apocalypse Inevitably yeah, comes. Inevitably comes with uh, using yeah. my physics knowledge to save the day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this this is the only time I always say this, this is my this fantasy, bro. This is the only time we're valuable ever. <laughs> rebuilding society. Yeah, literally, we're the last resort. Like, yeah, <laughs> society society needs to rebuild. We're like, yeah, I mean, you can right. build, you you can use engines and stuff. Mm-hmm. But it's like, yeah, you can. Um, how, how would you do? How would you go about that? Let's say you you're. You're a nomadic person now mm-hmm. that you ca- you you're with your tribe of people. They've mm-hmm. adopted you. Mm-hmm. You had nothing to the to the to the table just yet, <laughs> but you yep. discover a geothermal well. Ooh, that's already money right there. <laughs> so you recognize the potential. Yeah, uh, but I was going to start even simpler than that because I would have assumed that probably a geothermal well would not be that easy to find. No. I wouldn't know how to find one. Yeah, I wouldn't know. You so, just kind of get lucky, right? Y- yeah, yeah. But my better guess would be to find a river. Because rivers are a moving river. Because I feel like okay. I could probably find a river or a stream that's moving constantly. Because mm-hmm. then all you got to do is just build a, a water wheel. And a water wheel is just so fucking easy. Because all you got to do is just chop a couple trees, build some paddles, and it's in the shape of the wheel. And then there you go. You have a water wheel now. And then to actually get the energy from that, extract the energy from that, um, what could you do? This so is I the guess tricky would be part. The, yeah, so I guess how would we actually extract the energy from it? So I guess... It'd be like, what would you? What would the function of it be? So I don't know how it would store energy. Maybe you could store energy like in a gravitational way, where um, you could have it like. Um, well, it depends on what lift kind of, something. Because typically, when we when we want what we want energy to do is we convert that energy into work. Yeah, we yeah. want to do something meaningful with that energy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you could you could you could do something. I could first I could see something where like a very rudimentary thing is where. If your water wheel is literally just like tied to a pulley 
and you're lifting a rock, then you've just done let's work. Say you wanna, let's say you, wa- let's say you want to give this little town electricity. How would you do it? Oh, so then you would probably have to do something where you'd have to have alloy. Let's assume you have all the ingredients. You have metal alloys that are. She has to build a battery, probably. Let's say you have metallic. No, no, no. Let's forget batteries. For now, you oh, have you access- need an engine. An engine. Let's just say you have metallic. You have access to metallic alloys. You have magnetic materials mm-hmm. at your at your disposal. Yep. How would you do it? So I'd have to build an engine then. Uh huh. So what I would do is, if I could have a magnet, I would just build a simple, um, a simple engine with a magnet through a coil using Faraday's law. Mm-hmm. And then if you have a magnet, like let's say if you had a a magnet that could just pump back and forth into a into a, a um, solenoid. Then you can just generate current that way, and then there you go. You got current now, there and you then go. you can hook Terrence. that up to your hydroelectric thing. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Easy. Terrence just recreated that. <laughs> but this is this is the simplicity of it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that bad. But of yeah. course, you got to find a magnet then. But what you um, would, yeah, I mean, you would need to go extract those materials. But, like, but I think you could even make a magnet. Because all you can do is, all you'd have to do is... um. No, you'd have to find the alloys. You'd have to go out in nature and find... Oh, because we're assuming we don't have electricity, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I guess we'd have to... Um, ferrite, have find the ferrite materials. The ferrite is kind of weird, though. I actually did a Twitter post on ferrite, uh-huh. and ferrite is one of the strongest um, naturally occurring permanent, permanent magnets, but mm-hmm. it only forms due to being struck by lightning. So it's literally like these weird ferromagnetic domains that are all scattered initially. Oh, interesting. But then they actually get struck by lightning and that lightning burst actually gives a pulse of magnetic field that actually aligns all those things in this way oh, where it becomes it, a it forces magnet. the the spins to yeah. take one direction. Huh. Yeah, so it's it's like this weird kind of it's weird um it's a natural phenomenon but this weird kind of lucky natural phenomenon yeah. where You'd have to like kind of think about how to make permanent magnets. So I guess you'd have to like find actually a ferrite cave or something, and like set up some lightning rods or something. <laughs> <laughs> Get them struck by lightning, yeah. and you have your permanent magnets. So wow. it's getting a little bit complicated, but but it's probably these, easier ways. <laughs> okay, but these are the lengths you have to go to give electricity back to society in some sense. Right? Maybe, maybe there's probably some. Um, if 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 you're uh, the commenters on on our YouTube or uh, whatever mm-hmm. wherever you're listening to this, yeah. if you got easier ways uh, to rebuild society, to rebuild um, an energy source, and then transferring that energy source, what would you guys? Let's say do? your job is to make electricity again for a town. Yeah, yeah. How would do you? Do you, do you have any um, other ideas, Juan? I mean, you could use. What would you do? Maybe lazy- maybe you start with the. Um, maybe you can start with the. Uh, the, the the thermal spring. What the would you do with the spring? spring? Yeah, I mean, like the whole thing is being able to convert that steam into meaningful energy, yeah. right? Yeah, I would do the same thing. I would probably use the the. You can use a water wheel for that too, as well. You right? can, but but let's just say you you have to recognize that you have to use your environment to your advantage and adapt accordingly. Yeah, right? but. But in this case, I but think you can do the same thing. Yeah, the principle the principle of it is you want to exploit magnetism, and that that's where you get your your your. But current. can you think maybe of another way besides magnetism? Could we make it? Could we make electricity without magnetism? I we mean, could do because you can do chemi- you can do chemically. Yeah, but I mean, then the, the thing like, is, we're I mean, not the, chemists, so. But the thing is, the Egyptians had a similar <laughs> thing. Like the Egyptians had, they discovered simple batteries. Like they made. Cells. That's what I'm saying. So we could do um, th- we could do an electrolyte solution where you if you can. can find a cathode and an anode, that might be well. You a just really need salt and it. yeah, you would need something like a salt material, like sodium. You would need like a sodium bath and then something that's like a yeah the opposite, which would be. But then you would need to know some basic level of chemistry. Yeah, which I'm not super good at. I know you can make um, um, batteries of like lemons or potatoes or something. Yeah, or maybe I think, both. I think the Egyptians used. Yeah, I think they use uh, some kind of sour. I mean, the good thing is that you can kind of taste, your taste buds have this kind of sense of what is, what is a salt and what is a, mm-hmm. what is a, whatchamacallit, cations? Uh, Are they cations? Oh, cations and anions? Yeah. I forget what the forget distinctions what, I forget are. what the distinction is. <laughs> but basically, you it's the opposite of a, of a, of something like a sodium was Na+, plus, where it's like it needs an electron. Is that why looking, they hurt? Because they're like... It's looking to bind. Ionizing your tongue. <laughs> yeah. It's looking to bind with an electron, so you need to find like something with the op- opposite, like uh, chlorine. You know what uh-huh, I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so you, it it creates a potential difference between these two, where the the 
the electron from the, let's say, chlorine wants to go to the sodium. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can create this potential difference and then drive, you can create a current that way. That'd probably be... Uh, but it's very rudimentary. It's very low levels yeah, of current yeah. that you achieve. You'd have to find a way to make it scaled up somehow. The most efficient way to do this is what you're saying by creating, having a magnetic... You think. Maybe material, so. And then just having it like mechanically oscillate uh -huh. <laughs> so that you drive current. Um, well, maybe you could use both in conjunction and then have the, um, the cell be one of your storage mechanisms. You can where, have that. Um, where how would you do that? Where um, I mean, you'd be running. Oh, then, you can make maybe an electrolyte by. Um, once you're doing that, you can actually charge the uh, the water in there, the bath, the electrolyte solution. Um, but then what does that do? Because I know the electrolyte solution. When you charge a solution, you actually get a separation. You do of atoms. You, this you, is kind of what we talked about in the last podcast yeah. with the um, with the uh, what is it the. Uh, the thing cold fusion yeah um but then does that help anything i don't even know if that helps does that help actually get it creates your i mean it's the same thing as a, you're basically recharging a battery that's you constantly recharge and charge. Uh, okay so there's something there we'd have to yeah. like be the thing is it's not as efficient it's not you you'd be able to power i mean you'd have batteries but then you'd have like you'd have to build the clay I mean, I imagine yeah, you don't have access yeah. to like a lot of materials, but I imagine you have to build a clay pot or something uh -huh. that's ceramic insulating. Yeah, it can be simple. It can be simple, but I just think the most efficient way to rebuild society is what you're saying: like get get access mm. to magnetic materials as fast as you can. To it might be, be able hard to though, create man, to find natural permanent magnets. That's yeah. the only problem I'm seeing. You'd have to find a way to get natural permanent magnets, or maybe you can somehow use static electricity to induce magnetism maybe i could see that whereas if you can somehow make a static discharge large enough that would actually make magnets become permanent mm -hmm. permanently magnetized that might work yeah but i don't know there's you, some things or you, you can be a cheap bastard and just like scavenge gasoline <laughs> scavenge gasoline oh you're you're assuming that the infrastructure of reality still exists of some let's just but that makes it easier i think i think it's harder to it's a lot easier if things already exist yeah i'm thinking of like a pure like situation if you were just to land on mars yeah and you had nothing left or something yeah. you have to use the natural resources yeah. of the world yeah life is a lot easier when you have things left over because then you can just use whatever exists already yeah. and just fix that up yeah but i think that those are the basic principles to rebuild um I think yeah. I think you I, ideally you would need you would need some you need to exploit your knowledge of electricity and magnetism. Mm. Dude, that'd be a fun ass movie. I need to see. We need to see a um, a zombie apocalypse movie that has like specialists, like physicists on a yeah. team, and like <laughs> <laughs> and like really smart people who build shit from scratch. That'd be yeah. interesting. Like a physicist, an engineer. Um, yeah, I've had this discussion with like postdocs in my group, um, where we would get into like how would you rebuild society if you could. Mm. Um, and he, he's like, yeah, it'd be simple. He'd be, It'd be like, a funny movie. This. Like if a bunch of graduate students had to rebuild society, <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of physics graduate students had to rebuild society. What would happen? Yeah, it would be, <laughs> it, it would be, I think it would be possible. It's just, yeah. it's just, uh, the level of manual labor that you would need to do <laughs> would kill us off. <laughs> would kill us off entirely. Because like, nobody would want to do the, land, the no. manual labor. <laughs> and then I was just having a discussion with one of our roommates where we were like, yeah, um, and a lot of the a lot of the physicists that we know don't want to have kids, so it's like, okay, that we're just not going to continue society. <laughs> that was going to happen. <laughs> That's why it takes all kinds of people. It takes yeah, all kinds. it takes all kinds of people. So, <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lenz's law would, you know, producing EMF. If you're talking about for you folks that want to do more research on this, I guess, mm -hmm. ingrained it in your mind, Maxwell's equations, yeah, particularly. The third one, which I'm remembering, which is uh, the um, Del Crossy. Yeah, the Del Crossy. Mm -hmm. It's so funny that we we don't remember the official names, but it's <laughs> yeah. just like you know operationally what it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I do though. That, that's Faraday's. It's law. the EMF law. Yeah, yeah I, I know law. the names. Yeah, yeah. Because it's the first one we start with. The Del dot E is it's Gauss's, Gauss's law. law. The Del the, dot B is the magnetic Gauss law, yeah. whatever that is. And then there's the Faraday's no law and the yeah. Ampere's law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. It's pretty pretty they got, basic. They got names. But know know the math, know the physics. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll it'll take you far. 
the other issue is like you you would need to if you wanted to rebuild society in that case i think you'd run into the issue of, ha- of needing ac dc at that point like you know what i mean because mm. you're, you're gonna be if you're talking about going distances yeah yeah because yeah. then because i'm if, trying to keep it local man i'm just trying to keep my 10 people around me survived <laughs> <laughs> we can scale up later i'm just trying to get yeah, that yeah, first yeah. step <laughs> yeah yeah but that's yeah. the hard part like that's the next hard part where you're like now you're trying to make <laughs> acdc converters and shit <laughs> yeah now you're trying to make copper i don't know if you're gonna go with copper wiring but you need something with like with a high enough uh heat i mean uh what is it um i always mess these up it's because i always get them inverted the the amount of energy that something like the heat capacity of something like low heat capacity but conducts good like a good thermal conductor is a good well copper also, is a good thermal conductor and and, and, and good electric, electric conductor. Conductor. Yeah, yeah. yeah so in that case you would need access to good copper wiring or some sense mm-hmm. to like be able to give electricity to people mm-hmm. but then also have people recognize that um not to touch the wire, so they, they well, you just wrap it. You just wrap it. <laughs> yeah, but there's so many things that we take for granted in yeah. modern society. That's yeah, like, yeah. Oh yeah, you need access to insulating materials, <laughs> and you need conducting material, good conducting materials. There's so much science is built on the backbone of right of all this, but yeah, but you'd have to probably find a way to like build a build a way to construct these things. So you'd have to make your own kind of factory so you can actually make it. If you're talking about large scale, once you're really getting into building up society. But I'm thinking just like low level, like, you know, the just minimum. very local. How can I just survive myself with electricity and yeah. have a decent-ish life? Yeah, you're like, how can I play? Let's say you're one of these types who like just want to get their uh, the internet back up. <laughs> <laughs> how can I get my League of Legends back up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess is there anything else? I mean, we're almost um, at fifty-five minutes. Is there anything else you want to like? Add uh, about the- I guess maybe final thoughts. What do you think about Thorium? Seems legit. Seems, Seems not legit. legit. Seems legit. I think. I just think we need somebody to take the mantle. Uh, somebody with money. Probably. Yeah, I, I remember a comment that you mentioned yesterday that I kind of didn't want to. Remember, I kind of stopped you because I wanted to save it for the podcast. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, you're yeah. like, I wonder why Elon doesn't doesn't get into energy or something. I was like, yeah, that's actually, to me, I think that this would actually be a very good thing for Elon to invest in because, you know, he kind of has ideas of making moon bases, you know, for when his starship is completed. Mm -hmm. Um, And the thing is, if you want to have real energy production on the moon, thorium reactor is the way to go, it Mm -hmm. seems, in terms of energy. So I feel like thorium's got to be on the rise. Yeah. Because it's such a good way to have uh, power like it's really the only feasible way to have continuous power on the moon I don't know of any other way really that you're going to have that yeah unless there are geothermal wells in the moon that we don't know about <laughs> which <laughs> maybe, I, I guess maybe they just operate on really low energy I'm not sure how the ISS does it I think they use solar but I wonder if that's their yeah. only way of doing it I'm not you sure you also need low, very low power for that's that. what I'm thinking so yeah. maybe if your moon base is extremely low power but that's no fun yeah it's not fun <laughs> I mean, it's not like you can bask out. You yeah. can have leisure time on the moon. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to go outside and lay in the sun and bake yourself? Right, you need some kind of like you. And the internet's not that bad on the moon, probably. No, you know it's not, not that far away. No, no, probably not. You still get well. You probably yeah. get like a a few like almost maybe like. I bet you probably don't even get a minute of latency. No, probably not. You probably, but you probably get some latency, but it's you're probably going the bearable. speed of light, dude. Yeah, it's, it's probably very light. bearable. Yeah, right. I mean, it's probably not. It's probably better than than if we're talking about pure satellite signals. Yeah, it's probably better than the uh, you think? than the yeah, because at least you, you're probably just getting internet on the moon base. It doesn't mm. have to travel like through optical wires over long distances. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. The sig- if today nowadays, like the signal gets fucking mm-hmm. jar jarbled, jarbled. Garbled? Garbled? Yeah. It either works. <laughs> <laughs> Gets garbled up, you know, when it goes to multiple communication channels mm-hmm. um, or over long distances. We're talking about optical wires carrying signals. Like, we're talking about... Yeah, but sig- also those signals get fixed up. They do get amplified. They, mm-hmm. they, they're, I know there are markers that you yeah. you reach or check they get re They get re-fixed and all this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. But, but still, that takes time. 
Yeah. You know, that's the latency in the system. But I imagine if you're operating purely on satellites and it's things are going the speed of light, they don't have to travel over the same. But like, I but I would argue fiber optics still going the speed of light as well. It's yeah. so it's so close to the speed of light. It's not it's it's completely oh, so negligible you're, you're to saying, the human. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're not gonna see any noticeable latency difference between yeah. that. Well there you I'm go. just strictly concerned about the distance. No, I don't. I don't, I don't think. So it I can't know. I don't remember how far away the moon is, and I know it takes about eight minutes for the Mars signal. I think, isn't that true? Or am I yeah, lying yeah. about that? Eight minutes for the sun, I think. Oh, for the sun. Yeah, so yeah. Mars is even less than that. Yeah. Well, whatever time scale it is, I feel like the re- the internet would probably be fine on the moon. Yeah, internet would be fine. <laughs> you probably have some. No, actually, you're right. I think you might have some yeah. latency. Probably yeah, a but probably not microseconds, too bad. maybe. Yeah, not too bad. But yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. It let, leave a comment. Well, mm-hmm. actually, no, let's wait till the outro. Outro. All right. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. For making it this long. And uh, I guess the question we have is, uh, I guess what is the question? Let's do the one with rebuilding society. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, guys, uh, how would you rebuild the society if you could? So, um, leave us a comment on what, what you would do for your energy source. Yeah. And then how you would distribute that energy yeah. specifically. Cool, cool. And once again, thank you for listening and make sure to follow us on the socials. Yep. Uh, I can bros on Twitter. Well, first like, share, (laughs) comment, subscribe. You always forget that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sharing is the most important part, but yeah. Yes. But also subscribing too is good. So That too. (laughs) Actually, they're all important. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But I'll... And yeah, and then also check out the website, iganbros.com. Check out the new updated version of it. Um, a little bit changes, nothing too drastic, but just check it out. Mm-hmm. Um, also, follow us on Twitter, Eigen Bros, Instagram, Eigen Bros, and then also TikTok, possibly if it's still there, <laughs> Eigen Bros 2, and we will see you guys next time. Yep.